is one exception to the sexual indiscretion allowance. Gender. A female politician is expected to be faithful to one partner. Okay, now finally I'm going to read something that it took me a long, long time to learn as an American. You know, you go to France and people stare at you, you know, and you think they're being really mean, especially in, 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 in Paris, you know, they just sort of look at you with this look. It's really a compliment because it's le regard, it's like Giscard looking at you and saying, you know, you're worthy of my look. But you're not supposed, you're not supposed to smile in France. The, Fr the French think that smiling is banal, trite, and very American. So. Um, uh, I'm just going to read you a little bit about uh, the smile so that all of you, when you go to France next time, will know what to do and what not to do. We can practice le regard later. It's a little hard for me because I'm nearsighted and, you know, I just don't know what you're supposed to do when you have to you take your... But taking off the glasses, I guess, can be very sexy. Okay. All right. One way to understand the tension in everyday public behavior is to consider the importance of the smile. Smiling is complicated in France. Americans are accustomed to smiling at strangers. The French, particularly the Parisians, are not. That helps explain why some Americans find Parisians rude. The reluctance to smile does not indicate the absence of kindness in the French character, but it does signal reserve. A French smile is fraught with too much meaning to be stowed as a mere pleasantry. When a smile is shared on the metro, for example, complicity is created and the two smilers suddenly exist as a pair. Even without a word, they are no longer separate individuals. Perhaps the non-smiling stems from French history, foreign invasions, revolution, and civil wars that fueled suspicion and contributed to the construction of facades of politesse. Whatever the historical reason, a smile is weightier in France than in much of the world. And this is even truer in Paris. According to a February 2010 poll, 71% of the French people living outside Paris believe that Parisians smile less than the rest of France. I was having lunch at a bistro one day with two women friends when two elegantly dressed men in their late 20s perhaps were seated next to us. The tables were so close that we had to move ours to accommodate them. One gave me a smile that showed teeth and spoke openness. He's dressed like a Frenchman, I said to myself, but he's not French. <laughs> no French man would smile like that. I was right. He was German. A smile can have a purpose. For Christine Lagarde, the finance minister and former national swimming champion, it is symbol of power and strength. And I, I will guarantee if she gets Dominique Strauss-Kahn, you're going to see her smiling a lot, because she's more American than she's French. Political life has hardened me, she once, wrote in, 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 uh, she once told an interviewer from French L. When I was on the French synchronized swimming team, the coach hammered into us, grit your teeth and smile. So now today I grit my teeth and smile, and I do the job. When the smile is bestowed one-on-one, -on -one, it is a gift, or more. It is so powerful it can suggest sexual interest. In the movie Le Divorce, Kate Hudson, who plays an American ingenue living in Paris, is advised by her young French lover to look more serious. You were smiling too much, he tells her when she has an unpleasant encounter with the American husband of her brother-in-law. Don't do that. Smiling gets a girl in trouble. Bernard Henri Lévy, the writer, couldn't tolerate the smiles of strangers as he traveled across America. In his book, American Vertigo, Lévy railed against those effectless, emotionless, emotionless, emotionless smiles, smile that seemed to be there only to signify the pure will to smile. When I asked Lévy about this observation, he told me that in France, the smile is a deliberate sign. We decide at what point we send it, he said, and we don't send it right away. We send the signal only when the process of seduction has begun. In America, it's nothing. It's like his voice filled with disgust as he uttered the next words. It's like shaking hands. <laughs> A French businessman I know who travels all over the world said that when he visits the United States, the most uncomfortable place for him is the elevator because people smile and strike up conversations with him and he can't escape. <laughs> <laughs> we, 
Whenever I'm baffled about French customs, I turn to the writer and television host, Philippe Labreau. I asked him about smiling, and he replied with a story from his time as an exchange student in, in, at Washington and Lee University in Virginia in the 1950s. Labreau was shy, awkward, badly dressed, and only 18 when he landed on the campus with its southern culture, coat and tie dress code, and strict rules. One was the speaking rule. You had to say hello, good morning, good evening to anyone you passed, Labreau recalled. One day he was summoned by a student advisory council and told he wasn't greeting people properly. It wasn't a trial or anything like that, but I can remember the sentence. It is printed in my memory. Philippe, you don't quite understand the spirit of the speaking rule. Labreau replied, of course I do. I say hello and goodbye and good morning and good evening to everyone. Yes, the student representative said, but you don't smile. For me, Labreau continued, it was a good moment because I thought, okay, I'll get you guys. I'll smile. Don't worry. I'll play your game. And I played the game. So was it hard, I asked? No, because it's not hard to p play a role in a comedy, he said. Yes, a comedy. I mean, it was forced. Why should I smile at someone I don't know and maybe I don't like? It's completely hypocritical to smile all the time. <laughs> the French reticence to smile immediately and indiscriminately, he said, comes from what is taught in childhood, a rather strong dose of skepticism of reflection. We are a critical people. We are a literary people. We have to question everything. It's so we will never be duped. For Labreau, le regard, the look, is much more important than the smile. You can see more in the eyes than in the lips, he said. The eyes are total life, the absolute personality of someone. There can be magnetism, there can be light. Boredom, stupidity, yes, stupidity, the emptiness of the look. There it was again, le regard. I told him I had a stupid question. In America, you're taught to stress your good points, I said. So you have a great smile, you use your smile. But what if you have terrible eyes? How do you do le regard? I'm nearsighted, so how do you talk with your eyes if you can't see? And what about when you get older and your face droops and you smile more to look younger? You compensate, Labreau said. Your body has many, many weapons. You use the rest of your body. You play with your hands, your voice. Voice is a fantastic weapon of seduction. And you use humor and make people laugh. Any man who can make a woman laugh can have that woman, bien sûr. On that point, he was right, bien sûr, but that talent is universal. Thank you. OK, over to you. Warren, who just winked at me. Warren, I have to tell you something, though. You're never supposed to wink. In, it, it, yeah, you don't wink. You winked at me. You didn't even realize you winked. You see, it's the, it's the, it's the Latin. Is there a mic? Are we using microphones or we're not using microphones? No? OK. So yeah. Well, I'll just try to speak on I wanted to ask you a question about the aftermath of the Dominique Strauss um, uh, incident. Uh, two things happened in the immediate aftermath. One is his wife, Ann Zinker, came forward and said, I've always been proud of the fact that he's the only to use. Um, some other French women initially expressed similar kinds of thoughts, but then on the second bounce, you suddenly had a number of French women coming forward and saying, wait a second, uh, these guys are making fools of us. Maybe this is the moment uh, where we ought to take on. They didn't say this, but more of an American attitude. The second thing I wanted to ask you about a similar thing was French journalists who have always decried American journalists' habit of looking into um, the private lives of our politicians. Full disclosure, I'm a journalist. And, <laughs> Some French journalists were reported to have come forward and said, maybe we should have been paying attention to this. Um, and you had the recent incident of one of Sarkozy's ministers uh, who had a particular fetish for fondling the feet of his employees, suddenly resigning. And it was said that prior to the Dominique Strauss-Kahn thing, he probably would not have had to resign. 
Sorry to make the question so long. I just wanted to ask you, is there a change underfoot now? Has the DSK incident uh, caused these changes in both French journalism and in French women's attitudes about this kind of behavior? Sounds like a great story, Warren. You see, he's still being my editor. Uh, you said something really interesting, that, that uh, this is a moment when, and that's key. I, I, mean, I, I uh, have said that this is France's Anita Hill moment. You know, Anita Hill, the woman who challenged Clarence Thomas, and uh, he still got confirmed to the Supreme Court, but it changed, it changed uh, sexual harassment laws, which were strengthened. It changed behavior in the workplace, and that's what's happening in France. You're starting to have a conversation opened about what is the nature of power, what is the abuse of power, power, what is sexual harassment, what's its definition, and you're starting to have women come out and say, we don't like this behavior that we sort of tolerated, we didn't know if we felt comfortable or not, but it, it goes, it goes, um, uh, it crosses the line. So, but that said, I will say, as, as, as Warren, Warren mentioned, the, the case of Georges Tron, who, who was a junior minister who had to resign from the, the um, cabinet because he was a foot fetishist and used to uh, force women in his employ to uh, submit to his foot massages, but then the massages started moving up the body. And two of them came forward and, and, and uh, um, filed uh, legal cases against him. But then you've got Frédéric Mitterrand, the culture minister, uh, minister of culture and communication, who wrote an autobiographical memoir about, uh, that included uh, explicit um, uh, anecdotes about his buying um, boy prostitutes in Thailand and Morocco, and uh, he's still culture minister. Yes. I'm curious about the inspiration for the book, and at what point did you feel that you compiled enough evidence to compile the book? Okay, did you hear the question? Okay, it was about what's the inspiration for the book, and when I felt I had enough to to um, to enough information compiled. The second part is easy. You have a deadline. You meet the deadline. You know, I, I tell young journalists, you know, until an hour before the deadline, you aim for perfection, then you aim for doneness. It had to get done. Um, but the, the other question is a good one. Uh, I, I actually had to give a speech at the New York Public Library in 2008. Uh, Paul Leclerc asked me to give a speech on France, and I thought, okay, I can talk about you know, France um, having troops in Afghanistan or France re-entering the military wing of NATO. But I didn't want to bore the audience, so I thought, you know, Sarkozy had just been in office for a year. He was married to Carla, and I said, well, why don't I tell people the secret to French life, which is seduction. And my editor from my last book, Paul Golub, uh, who's a great editor at, uh, at Times, now at Times Books, um, was in the audience and he came up to me afterwards and said, Elaine, this is your next book. And we did the book together, so it was great. Yes, sir. So this is an example of participatory journalism. No, can you stand up and speak a little louder because uh, we don't have mics, so we have to. Right. So this is an example of participatory journalism and uh, there are dozens of encounters in the book where you yourself could have been seduced various different contexts. How did you manage to shield yourself from the seduction to be able to write a dispassionate account like this? What, did I write a dispassionate account or was I seduced? <laughs> but I thought it was a dispassionate account. No. It certainly doesn't read like a eulogy of France's ability to seduce. It probably because I, I, I covered um, national security in the CIA for too long, you know, so I, I uh, yeah, I came with my, like my notebook and my glasses. But it's an interesting question though because I will say that when I told men, French men, what I was doing, um, they got this sort of deer in the headlights look, you know, like, oh God, what is this woman of a certain age thinking about? And, or else they, they jumped in with a little bit too much enthusiasm. But when I, told, when I told women about it, they got it right away. So they made my job easy. Thanks. Yes. I wanted to ask you about literary could, could you uh, speak up so everybody can hear you, sir? I'm sorry. Uh, by contrast, take somebody like Michelle Weldon. He tends to.